Well, I grew up in the swamps of southwest Louisiana, and I happened to go, I was in Civil Air Patrol, and I happened to go to Chenault Air Force Base in Lake Charles, and saw the Thunderbirds, and I was hooked. And I knew I had Vietnam War was on, there was a draft on, if you graduated from high school and didn't go to college, you had your choice of green uniforms. So I went to college. I, know I, I knew I had to get a college degree to, to uh, get a commission to, to go fly. So I majored in physics. Easiest subject I could do. <laughs> <laughs> and I made it. <laughs> uh, came into the Air Force in uh, 68, January 68, and was off and running after that. Well, very good. As you heard earlier in that uh, introduction, uh, his, his bio, you graduated from college and then charted a path for service in the Air Force while the fighting in Vietnam was, was, was going on. Um, could you walk us through what it was like when you first joined the Air Force? You had to understand you'd be headed for combat in the near term. How did that affect your attitude and that of your fellow airmen at the time? Well, we knew what we were getting into. So when, you were in the, when I was in F-4 training, you paid attention. Uh, we got crewed up early on in, in the, the process of uh, going through the F-4 program. I was crewed up with a guy from uh, George Boniface. He'd served three and a half years in the backseat of the F-4 as a pilot in Europe. So I had to learn everything George's way to pass the flights, because that's all he understood. And I had to learn everything Book, book answers to pass the academics, and after, between all those two, I came up with my ideas of how things should be. <laughs> you know, I got pretty good at what I did. Okay, as we, uh, now, now as we all know, that the F-4 has two seats, and guess what? They both count. Yep. Um, it took a pilot and the weapon systems operator to transform that jet into a highly lethal combat machine. Could you walk us through the division of labor? What were your individual responsibilities and how did you team with your partner? Well, I was uh, in charge of navigating, bombing, uh, radar bombing, watching the systems. Uh, one of the great things about the Air Force F-4s versus the Navy and the Marine Corps F-4s is the Air Force Air Force, since we had two pilots in the airplane to begin with, they had a stick in the back. So if the pilot didn't want to, re to uh, fly the jet, I flew the jet. If he didn't want to refuel the jet, I refueled the jet. I could fly close, I could land the jet. Uh, it wasn't as smooth as the pilot, but I could get it on the ground. <laughs> so, and there was nobody, when I was flying in Southeast Asia, none of the old head pilots wanted to take a, a backseater with them that couldn't land in case they had to. The regs said that I couldn't land, couldn't fly close, couldn't refuel, and nobody read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rules were made for people who need them. That's right. right? Yeah, that's right. So you head to Vietnam in 1971. Yeah. Um, that was right before things really kicked into high gear in the conflict. It was. American airmen had been prohibited from going into North Vietnam with the conclusion of Rolling Thunder in 1968. But that all changed few months after you arrived with the commencement of Operation Linebacker. Right. How about walking us through those dynamics? How did the culture change at the unit level as we leaned into an offensive posture? Well, when I first got there, it was kind of like going to the gunnery range in the States, but we were overseas carrying real live weapons. It was not a high threat area, it was just daily flying, and that morphed into more sorties, recce sorties, reconnaissance sorties, looking for SAM sites in North Vietnam. And one of the things we had to do was train ourselves how to fly air to air, because we were not trained to fly that. Uh, the, the powers that be at the time thought that if you got into a dogfight in training with another airplane, different type, not an F-4, you were going to lose the airplane. So we weren't allowed to do that. Needless to say, the first time I ever saw a similar airplane in my vicinity was a MiG-21 behind me. And I wasn't smart enough to be scared. 
and he wasn't seen enough to shoot. <laughs> Luck as it would be. Uh, so we had to change things, and it took a, a coordinated effort by the wing hierarchy to make sure that we were able to fly into Hanoi every day and survive. Because when we were flying, there was no rescue. So if you got shot down, if you didn't die, you were picked up and put in prison camp. Not my idea of a fun time. The Hilton there didn't give points. <laughs> and the room servers sucked. <laughs> Well, flying up north dialed up the risk factor big time, as you just alluded to. As a matter of fact, if I recall, there was a period between the end of June and the beginning of July in 72 when we lost seven F-4s. How did that impact you and your fellow airmen? Once we got started going into Hanoi every day, we took losses. I will tell you that the first day, we, the first day I linebacker on the 10th of May, they recalled the squadron with the wing and we were sitting in Intel, and it's about 4.30 in the morning, and nobody knows what's going on. The curtains, the briefing boards are covered. Finally, Colonel Gabriel, wing commander, walks in and sits down, and they pull the curtains away from the board and point it to Hanoi and said, gentlemen, the target today is downtown. You could hear a pin drop on the carpet. You could smell the fear. Nobody had ever been. At the end of the briefing, Gabriel gets up and says, guys, because in those days we just had guys flying for us, said, guys, we've been waiting for this for a long time. Let's do a good job. Take a look at the guy sitting next to you. So you and your buddy are looking at each other, and he says, he may not be coming back. And you go, damn, can I have your stereo gear? <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we didn't lose anybody that day. It did wonders for our morale. So when we took losses, in the future, yeah, it was bad. We always showed up at the bar. The bar was the, the watering hole, the main meeting place after flying. And we'd always toast those that didn't come back. Knowing that tomorrow was just another day. Okay, with that, let's jump into some of those sorties that got you the kills. Okay. Um, could you talk a bit about how you and Steve Ritchie got your first kill and walk us through that sortie? Steve was the, wing wep was the squadron weapons officer. He replaced Bob Lodge, who was our wing weapons officer. So Steve was the most experienced guy in the squadron. Uh, Bob had been there longer. But Steve was very experienced. So we, and I was his assistant. So I flew with him off and on uh, before we started going uh, into Hanoi. So we were very comfortable with each other and we worked very well together. Uh, once we get, got into a point in, on an intercept, he was outside the cockpit, I was inside and outside, and I had a running commentary to give him information, airspeed, uh, altitude, whatever, where the MiG is, how, how the missile is doing, uh, anything he needed. I gave him, uh, gave him a commentary on it so that he didn't have to look inside the cockpit and take his eyes off the MiG. The MiG was a very small airplane. You take your eyes off of it, it disappears. So on the 10th of May, we're leading the pack. We're, we're the first F-4s in that day. So uh, Lodge and my roommate, Roger Locker, in, in, old, in uh, Oyster One, they have an airplane equipped with an IFF interrogator for the MiG-21. An IFF interrogator, IFF is what the eight, uh, air traffic control uses to control airplanes. Well, we used it to identify airplanes. Well, he had an airplane equipped with that, and I had an airplane equipped with that. So we're sorting, we could see targets out there beyond visual range. Uh, the code name for this was Combat Tree, the unclad. Combat tree was unclassified code name. The unclassified code name was classified. You couldn't talk about it. We didn't want them to know that we had this capability. So we, we're sitting there sorting targets. And as we get Lodge and number two get closer, they had the first element. They shoot, get two kills at max range. Our, our elements come into play. 
our wingman has doesn't have a radar, so he's there just for make sure nobody gets behind us. The MIG comes into play at about 17 miles. We start skin painting at 14 miles. We, we get a lock on, and he's in comes in range, and we shoot. The missile when it came off the airplane, the motor leaves a black trail behind it, and the missile pointed at the MIG. He was high enough to be leaving a contrail, and the contrail did a 180. Why he was looking out of the cockpit, I don't know. <laughs> but he put the missile out of range. MIG number four goes by us. We're still supersonic in the turn. We roll out 4,000 feet behind the MIG and fire a radar missile. The missile either went up the tailpipe and functioned. It blew, and when the, motor, when the missile warhead blew, it cut the airplane to pieces, or it went up next to the airplane and the proximity fuse functioned and cut the airplane to pieces. By the time we got up to 4,000 feet distance up to the debris, the MiG driver was already in a dirty yellow parachute and a piece of the MiG hit the airplane. Kushi found it. The airplane didn't care. <laughs> it didn't go down the engine, that's all we care about. <laughs> uh, at that point, we came back around, heading to the north to see where one and two were. And um, I saw my roommate's airplane, Oyster One, and behind him were a MiG-19 or two, and they were shooting. And before anybody could say anything, uh, Lodge's airplane, the lead airplane, the right engine blew up and took the left engine's hydraulics with it, and uh, it was on fire, heading for the dirt. Uh, as it was flopping around, every time it got out of the relative wind, the fire would come north uh, into the front, uh, the cockpit area, and finally the back cockpit turned brown, and my roommate uh, decided to, it was time to go. We didn't see any shoots out of the airplane. I saw the airplane slamming to the side of a hill, and then a, a MiG-21 saddled up on us, and we took it to the dirt. We got as low as we could go. Uh, the normal maximum airspeed of the F-4 on the deck is 700, a little over 700 knots. It's for the bolts holding the windscreen in. And when they fail, you'll never know it. Last time I looked at the airspeed indicator, we were above 850. We'd had the engines on this airplane tuned <laughs> hot. <laughs> and it was hot. So, so uh, as we accelerated <clears throat> out at about 1,000 miles an hour, the big stayed with us until he ran out of gas and went home. So we took the other two guys that were left with us, called for a tanker, and uh, finally a tanker called up that was close enough to do, do some good. And the F-4, when, when it's at optimum cruise, burns 100 pounds of fuel a minute. At our airspeeds and the oil flying, you can't get rid of the fuel that fast. I mean, it, it, it's like just opening a pipe and dumping. So when we finally got aboard the tanker, we had 2,400 pounds of fuel left in three airplanes, about 100 pounds a piece, and there's 350 pounds of gauge error. So you don't have any idea how much fuel you have. The engines are still running, you're good. <laughs> we got enough gas to keep everybody airborne, and then we took a load of gas to get home. And uh, that was my first kill. It was uh, Lodge and Locker, that was their third kill, and they were going to have to kill number four when the Mick got his first kill. So that day, between the Air Force and the Navy, we shot down 11 MiGs. Very successful mission in the total. For us, it was a, a good mission, but I would have given those MiGs back to just get my roommate and his pilot back. Okay, let's let us focus on um, Lodge and Locker for a minute. And for the audience, um, you, you heard up front when I talked about the values of of teamwork and dedication and duty, and I can't think of a greater display of that commitment than the eventual rescue of Locker. So, Chuck, could you tell us how that occurred? Locker, when he ejected out of the jet, it was just prior to the impact in the ground. He punches out, 
and he, he goes over the ridge line. So the jet hits on the front side of the ridge line, he's on the back side. They're not looking for him in the right area. He hits the ground. I mean, to say that he was hyper was probably uh, being too kind. He was so nervous that when he finally got on the ground, he could not work the class to get the survival pack out of the seat kit, and he left it. There was water in it. I don't know if there was any food in it, but there were radios and batteries in addition to what he had on board. And he started walking, getting away from the crash site. He came down the military crest. It's almost as if he was in the army. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> came down and he walked far enough south. There was no rescue where he went down. The helicopter, one, didn't have the fuel to get in, and two, couldn't hack the threats. So he walked far enough south. In three weeks, hadn't eaten anything. In three weeks, he was down at the end of the ridge line. His next decision was to drop into the river valley and try to cross the red and get south to the rescue point. He would not have survived that. Uh, he was so weak at that point, that he, and the Red is such a swift river, he would have floated down river and they would, they would have noticed him. We had a flight of F4, of one of our F4s in the area, and on their mission tapes, when they were reviewing it after the mission, there's this guy that said, hey, it's Oyster 1 Bravo, it's the backseater in Oyster 1, where in the hell have you guys been? So, well, okay. We sent a flight up there to do a radio search for him, and he comes up on the air. John Voigt, the four-star general running the air war at the time, canceled the JCS strikes to pick him up. And somebody asked General Voigt, why are you wasting so much man, material, money, and time to pick up one guy? And he said, because. You know, we joined, all of us joined the, the military for God, motherhood, apple pie, patriotism. You fight for your brother, buddy. And for them to leave him there, I don't know what we would have done. The morale would have gone into the, the toilet. But uh, we were all focused on getting him out. The helicopter, when it got to him, had two minutes. And if the, as the PJ was pulling him up the, the cable, if he thought that, that he was an imposter, he was gonna cut the cable. When they finally got him in the airplane, he, carried, he had his own personal nine millimeter, uh, which was rusted out by now. And the PJ said, well, that's a nice gun. And he said, have it. <laughs> the PJ gave him a, a soup can full of cookies and he put a few of them in his, he ate a few of them and put the rest of them in his pocket. And the guy said, why are you doing that? I said, you can't guarantee we're getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that was his food source. When they got him back to Udorn, somebody gave him a beer and he promptly threw up. He hadn't eaten in three weeks. It was a lot of courage on his part to keep his focus on just walking south. And there were a lot of things that happened on that three-week trip where it could have gone the other way, but it didn't. Fascinating. Now, the next two kills, two and three, occurred on July 8th. You're on a sortie in an F-4E, not the combat tree-equipped right. D. So how about bringing us into the cockpit on that sortie? Well, uh, you got to look at it. This is a team sport. It's not just the two guys in the airplane, the eight guys flying in the formation. It's the tanker guys that get us there. Where's uh, AWACS? Who in here is AWACS? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that AC-121 that's near the, your facility? That's what we use to fly against. Disco. Disco, yes. And, uh, they're sitting out in the Gulf of Tonkin. It's a long way to the target areas. And we get paired up with two MiGs. Disco is controlling us. 
we use three different control facilities. Disco, Red Crown, which is on the USS Chicago, and Chief Noel was the was a, uh, leader there. I think he ended the war with 11 kills that he had uh, helped get. And then we had T-Ball, which is a, we use later. Uh, but we're, at, we're working with Disco. It's a broadcast control thing. Uh, they don't use call signs. We knew all the voice. So when a certain voice showed up, we knew which controller it was. And then all of a sudden they go, Paula, which was our call sign, you're merged, which means they're out of the picture. And the problem was we didn't see anybody, but on his, his radar band, his, we're all on the same piece of sky and on his radar, and he can't tell who's who. So for about two minutes, there's eight of us with heads on swivels looking for two little bitty airplanes. And we, when we move, we, we move in a weave because the F-4 leaves a, a big black smoke trail behind it. It's a nice arrow. <laughs> and the, the target is always at the head of it. So we turned southwest, and as we rolled out southwest, I picked up a black fly speck on a white cloud. Fight's on. Our signal to the other three guys in our formation that we're getting ready to fight was when we went to full afterburner and jumped out in front and blew the tanks off the airplane. It's catch me if you can. It's not my job to keep you with me. If you can't stay with me, I got a new wingman. So they, they, they hurry up and catch up. Very shortly after we did that, we were lying abreast going opposite directions with a brand new shiny MiG-21. Had it been an American flying that airplane, he would have turned into us. That's what we expected. He turned away from us. It's a delta wing airplane. A delta wing airplane in a hard level turn bleeds airspeed, which means he's slowing down. Now, we, from reading his book, we knew that what he had just used was a J-leg tactic where the first guy comes in, he's the bait. He turns away from you, you see him, you follow him up, and the number two guy, the shooter, comes in and shoots you down. That only works if you haven't read his book, <laughs> which we had. Now, the F-4 is not an F-16. It's not a 9G airplane. If you've read the book, the F-4 book, it's an 8.5G airplane. If you haven't read the book, it's a 12G airplane. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever you can get out of it. And the best way to get it turned around is to roll the ones back to 135 degrees of bank at 500 knots, full after burner, stick in your lap. And 17 seconds later, you're going the opposite direction. So we rolled it up and waited. And here comes the second MiG, and he follows his lead. So instead of having to go all the way around this, the circle to get to him, we cut the circle. Fired two missiles at the trailing guy. One went through the cockpit, the other one went through the fireball. Came off. Tommy Fiesel, our number four, said, hey, he's on me. Came back into the fight. We're 4,000 feet from him. Fired an aft missile. The first time I saw the missile was in the exit of the wingtip area. So it did its Hayaka underneath the airplane and headed for the target. And I think the missile mortar was still burning when, when it got to him. Cut him in two and burned both ends. We found out later that these two guys had practiced every day just to meet us. They knew who we were. There was a price in our heads, and we knew it. That fight took one minute and 29 seconds. They would not commit two MiGs coming down from the north to help out and two MiGs coming up from the south to help out. If your training is bad, it doesn't take long to find out. And like I said, they knew who they were fighting. We weren't sure who we had, but they had flown every day. We found out later from Intel. Uh, we color coded everything over there. Red, white, and blue was a MiG-17, MiG-19, MiG-21. Black Bandit was out of gas. He was mingle fuel. He's a grape. Green Bandit was an ace, and these were green. So, you know when you're lucky and good, you're okay. <laughs> well, the next kill occurred on uh, August 28th, and uh, as I understand it. Steve Ritchie picked up another sortie and got an additional kill with a different weapon systems officer. So this marked your 
fourth and fifth kill. You're back in a D model Phantom. How did right. this sort of Well, uh, the reason this was not my fifth kill is because on, on Steve's second kill, I went on R&R &R and came all the way home to Sacramento to see my wife. Uh, you know, she, we didn't have cell phones, Facebook, anything like that. She got a letter from me every day that said I was alive last week. And that's all it said. So, on the 1st of June, Steve got killed on the 31st of May. On the 1st of June, we have a cabin up in Lake Tahoe, and the morning of the 1st of June, we woke up, it had snowed. Tell me how I was wrong. Now, did I take any grief for that? Yeah, I took a lot of grief for that. You know, it worked out in the end. So, uh, on the 28th of August, the, t the target is Tynier and Steel Mills, northeast of Hanoi. There's a big cloud deck between us and the steel mill. So we went over there to check the weather, because it's no use having the strikers with, loaded down with bombs going into that area if it's, the weather's not good. But we ran us, the weather was okay. So we told everybody to come on in. The water's fine. But we ran ourselves low on gas, so we're heading out. And I happened to be looking, I had a combat tree gear, so I'm looking at the radar, and 70 miles ahead of us is a MiG-21. And then 65 miles ahead of us, MiG-21. And then 60 miles, he's opposite, we're opposite direction. He's high, we're low. Uh, there's four guys chasing him from his six o'clock position. There's four guys coming in from the north after. He's not going home. <laughs> and we're head on. And because we didn't want to shoot and have the missile transfer lock, the radar transfer lock to an F-4 and shoot somebody a friendly down, we decided to, to convert the, the intercept. So we're at about 12,000 feet. Steve keeps asking our controller for altitude on the MiG and nobody's asking, nobody's talking to him. Finally, I said he's 25,000 feet. It's all math. You gotta look at where the radar is looking at. You had a computer to tell you everything. I was a computer. No, that's why you were a physics man. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming in, we're supersonic, and the way the, the graphics of the flight was, we had to cut it to the side to get turning room, at the same time climbing up, and then as the MiG started going past us, come in behind them. And we rolled out just outside of range with overtake. And a few seconds after we rolled out behind him, chugging along, and the MiG comes in range. And we fired, we fired two missiles in the turn, hoping that he would see it and do something besides go straight ahead. And he didn't see it. So, First missile comes in range. We fire the third with the third missile. Follow it right, right behind it. The fourth missile. The third missile goes by the MiG in a stall because he's at max range. But he sees it. He turns. That's all the fourth missile needed. He didn't go home. And uh, there was actually two MiGs. We didn't hear the call that that there was another MiG behind underneath him, and uh, he ended up landing, and we headed back home. Now, you've often, you've seen the Thunderbirds, or the Blue Angels fly? Yep, great show, don't they? They practice. <laughs> <laughs> we would talk about it on the tanker. Most dangerous part of the mission. <laughs> and now comes September 9th, yeah. the day that you get kills five and six. Right. And uh, Steve Ritchie has been sent home, and you're assigned a new pilot, John Madden. As I understand it, you're flying a MiG cap near Hanoi. Right. When did you first know bandits were in the area? Well, we knew there was some there because we were the egress cap. We were the rear guard. We're going to be going. We're going in as everybody's heading out low on gas. And we're working with T-Ball. T-Ball was a communications intercept operation. They were listening to the North Vietnamese GCI site talking to the MiGs. And so we were getting real-time information on where the MiGs were. And there was a guy coming off of a strike 
he'd hit the, some of the strikers, and he was coming home to Fukien. Fukien is just north of Hanoi. And T-Ball said, the controller said, why don't you guys go orbit Fukien? Soviet-style air bases have lots of AAA around them. And if you look at this chart where it shows the Mickey Mouse ears, that's where the SAM radars can see you when you're 15, 12 to 15,000 feet. So in Fukien is just north where it says 10, 10 DME arc, it's just north of there. They wanted us to go orbit that base. To fly with us, you couldn't be totally sane. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we went to Hanoi every day, and every day you roll the dice. And you hope that you're lucky until the end. So we start moseying down to Fukien. We get just north of the base, and number three, Bud Hargrove, called the backseater, and number three calls out, Sam, right three o'clock inbound. You go, whoops. And everybody's looked. Over there we go, that's not a Sam, that's the MiG. And he's out of gas. He's on final. I locked on to him. We fired two radar missiles at him, and both missiles hit the target. Unfortunately, the radar had transferred locked to the ground. And earth kills didn't count. <laughs> By that time, we start to turn final. We're at 625, 650 indicated. We're moving. We're turning final. He's doing. <coughs> Uh, 200, 225, we're trying, you know how hard it is to get an airplane slowed down from 650? <laughs> We've got it flat plated almost. And we come up aboard, we come aboard the MiG and say hi. Now, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. We had a D model F4 with no gun in it. <laughs> but we were there. And the MiG is surprised to see us. He picks up his gear and flaps. He's out of gas. He's very lightweight. Turns into us. They told us in training that if you try to horizontal rolling scissors, low altitude, low speed with an F4, you're going to die. You're going to put it out of control. We had no other choice. John was very smooth. So after about three leaves of this horizontal rolling scissors, the MiG is now accelerating enough, fast enough and pulls up out of the plane. He's lightweight, no gas. Uh, and we commit three in. Three is an E model with a Gatlin gun. He fires two M9s at the guy. Both missiles guided, no detonations. Don't know what happened. And by that time, he's now caught up with, with the MiG. In training, when you're shooting an aerial target, you shoot at 1,200 feet, break it off at 1,000. He got into 500 feet or so before he decided to shoot and emptied the gun into the guy. The F-4 carries 550 rounds, that's five and a half seconds, and he, he's got a three-second burst limit. He emptied the gun into the guy, and the maintenance guys were not happy. <laughs> they had to replace all the barrels. They had warped them. The MiG pilot punches out. The F-4 was so close to him, he almost hit him. And the airplane falls off on a wing and hits near a village. At that point, we get the flight back joined up. We head up towards Stud Ridge, just north of Hanoi. Get the flight jet joined up, and we cross the Red River, 15 miles west of Hanoi. And I think of a radar blip. It was huge. It's not ours. We know it. We don't know what it is. It's not. It, I couldn't read it. So it, it, it was a, one of their older jets. We got a, a beam them. They didn't see us. We we had fuel to fight, not fuel to run. We had to get rid of them quick if we were going to go home. We had 90 degrees of turn to go when the MiGs saw us. They pickled their tanks off, got rid of the fuel tanks, and did a brake turn into us. I mean, he stood it on his tail. Fights on. We fired two A9Js. The A9J had just come to finish developmental test. They had not gone to operational test. They sent them to us instead. We had no tech data. All we had was missiles and a tech rep. We fired two of those at the training MiG. He disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. He was out of the fight. The other guy was making tracks. In, from the back canopy, you could see him moving down the back canopy. I figured 15, maybe 20 seconds at the most, and he was going to be shooting. And the third missile was growling loud. It puts a growl in your headset when it sees a heat source. So John committed the missile. 
First thing the missile does is go whack. We go, damn, it's going for the sun. No. How many people in here hunt dove or duck? You know, you don't shoot the bird. You got to shoot in front of the bird, right? The missile was hunting bird. So it pulled enough lead. Next thing you see, it's inbound, and it ends up in the afterburner eyelids at the back of the engine, and there's an explosion. The MiG, he's pulling six, seven, eight Gs, rolls wings level, rolls inverted, and does a split S. He got 90 degrees of the split S done when he hit the ground. It was pretty sharp, though. At that point, one of the things that we had working for us is they had a very integrated air defense system. So when we were at the, in the traffic pattern in Fukien, and now the, the, we're in with the MiG in a dogfight, all the guns were on withhold. They couldn't fire. All the SAM sites were on withhold. They couldn't fire. As soon as that MiG crashed, and there was no other North Vietnamese airplanes in the picture, it was Katie bar the door. Everything from 23 up to 85 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. You know, if you needed attention, you would get that. One, two, and three were underneath all that, and we, we, we survived okay. Four was a little high, took a, a hit in the fuel cells, and exited Hanoi with 1,800 pounds of fuel. And we knew, and he knew, that he wasn't going home. We sent three with him going straight ahead. When they got down to 1,000 pounds of fuel remaining, by the time they cleaned the airplane off, and ran it out of gas. They had a fight in the cockpit. The pilot, if he pulls the handle and ejects, backseater goes first. Then the pilot will follow him out. The backseater has the option. He can go by himself, or he can flip a handle and have the pilot follow him out. It's not often you get to pull the handle on a real live airplane and eject out of it. So they made individual ejections. As they punched out our number five, our airborne spirit, which we never used, was sitting on the tanker. He was radio relaying information to the SAR package to come get these guys, and he flew over them as they were hitting the, the silk. They were on the ground 20 minutes when they got picked up. And uh, we decided, John and I, and our element lead, Mike Francisco and uh, Billy Bishop, decided that we were going to go straight to the to the base. We weren't going to try for a tanker. We didn't have gas to miss. If we missed the tanker, we would not go on home. We thought we could zero out the fuel by going all the way home. So we climbed to, uh, once we got out of the target area, we climbed to about 45, 46, 47,000 feet. The F-4, like I said earlier, burns 100 pounds a minute at uh, Athon Cruise. And it burns in buckets if, you, if you're low on the deck, high speed. So we thought we could just barely make it. So at about 80 miles out, uh, the glide ratio of the F-4 is two miles for every thousand feet. If, once you're lightweight coming in. So we started down, uh, just north of Udorn was Vintin, Laos. It's a restricted area there because all the Uzis are there and we weren't supposed to fly over there. I'm sorry. We were right over downtown Vintin. What are they going to do? Send me to Hanoi? I'm going tomorrow anyway. Um, so we come in. As we get close to the base, we take spacing, roll out on the final with the uh, gear up, flaps uh, to half, and then flaps down at the end. And a short final finally, finally dropped the gear. And I think John killed an engine once we touched down to make sure the other guy could land behind us. And that was my last combat mission. And somebody said, how do you feel about that? I said, well, you know, uh, I, did, I wasn't ready to quit. That was my 96th mission into Hanoi. Back in the old days, you had to have 100 missions to go home. When I was there, it was a year. But having 100 missions was kind of a, a, a goal. Uh, I would have enjoyed flying another four missions, but that didn't happen. The guys that were supporting us needed a chance to move up. And uh, our element lead that got the MiG at, uh, in the traffic pattern, got another MiG shortly thereafter. But he was on the, the, the right path, and then he uh, got killed in a training accident when the uh, center line tank came apart and low altitude and put the airplane under control. 
So you had to be ready for everything that happens over there. This was a real team sport. It takes a lot of people to make it work. Crew chiefs, load crews, keeping the missiles peaked. The supply guys keeping parts moving. The F-4 flies because of parts, because it breaks all the time. In fact, you can put an F-4 on the ramp and sit there and not do anything to it, and it'll break. <laughs> you know, and some, you know, who else is on the team? The cook. If breakfast wasn't ready at 4.30 in the morning, the next meal I ate was supper. Because lunch was already a candy bar, and I carried two frozen bottles of water with me. One I drank with the candy bar, the other I drank after I ejected and hit the ground. That was to get me calmed down enough to figure out what I'm doing next, because I had not planned that portion. <laughs> I didn't mind dying for my country. Getting taken prisoner was not on my bucket list. I knew what they were going to do. So, you know, it, took, it takes special people to do what we did. That doesn't mean we're all special. It means that it took people that were dedicated and focused on what this country is all about. And whether you're two old guys up here talking about a, a war a long time ago, or a bunch of younger troops still in active duty, it's all the same. We serve because this country is worth it. Either. As George Washington said, if you wish to avoid insult, you must be able to repel it. If you wish to avoid war, it must be known that you're at all times ready for war. And if we're not ready, we soon won't be.